Just a warning, this episode may contain language or topics that may not be suitable for all audiences. Listener discretion is advised. I'm Zoe. And I'm Chandi. And this is Bound by the Cloak. Today we're talking about Richard Trenton Chase, known as the Vampire of Sacramento. Richard Trenton Chase brutally murdered six individuals in the span of a month. As a child, Chase endured an unusual upbringing with a mother who suffered from severe mental health issues. And his parents would constantly fight and argue. Chase was diagnosed as a paranoid schizophrenic well before the murders took place. And he was institutionalized in 1975. He had been released in 1976 after being deemed no longer a danger to society. After this, his mental health condition worsened. Chase is a prime example of how deinstitutionalization affected the mentally ill across America, as well as their families. Today's guest is Dr. Catherine Ramsland, professor of forensic psychology and assistant provost at DeSales University. She holds a master's in forensic psychology from John Jay College of Criminal Justice, a master's in clinical psychology from Duquesne University, a master's in criminal justice from DeSales University, and a PhD in philosophy from Rutgers University. She's published over a thousand articles and over 70 books, including Confession of a Serial Killer, The Untold Story of Dennis Rader, The BTK Killer, How to Catch a Killer, Hunting and Capturing the World's Most Notorious Serial Killers, Dean Kuntz, A Writer's Biography, Prism of the Night, a biography of Anne Rice, and she's also written companion books to Anne Rice's novels. She has many books on true crime, as well as many books on vampires. She has a vast knowledge of serial killers, criminal psychology, and has even spent time doing deep research on the vampire subculture and community. Throughout history, vampires have been represented in various forms of pop culture, in movies, music, paintings, theaters, and more. With Catherine Ramsland, we learn the important distinction between vampires in pop culture and clinical vampirism, which was a condition that Chase had. Clinical vampirism, or also known as Renfield syndrome, is where someone has a delusional notion that they are a vampire and need blood. This stems from an erotic attraction to blood and the thought that blood has certain powers. Although Chase didn't identify as a vampire himself, he felt like he needed blood to survive. Thanks for having this conversation. And you're our first forensic psychologist that we're, we're speaking with. I'm actually a professor of forensic psychology. It's, there's a difference. Yeah, typically a, when you think of a forensic psychologist, you're talking about a licensed clinical psychologist who has a private practice and typically will do assessments for the court or prison system. I'm a professor, so I teach the subject area, but I'm not a practicing clinician. I'm a consultant. I do death investigations, but I don't see clients and I don't do anything with the court system. What got you interested in forensic psychology? I think I was more interested in serial killers first. I really didn't aspire to do to do anything that I'm currently doing. Uh, I used to teach philosophy actually at Rutgers University, and through uh, some strange circumstances, I started writing for a website called the Crime Library. It was very so when the internet was just sort of getting going, no social media of any kind at that time, and. It was a woman named Marilyn Bardsley who wanted to write some stories about serial killers. And I read, I think she had two or three posted. So I said I would write one for her from 
my hometown, so John Norman Collins from Michigan, I wrote that and then she wanted another and another. And within a year, I think Court TV took them over and I was suddenly writing for the Court TV website. So I decided to go to John Jay College of Criminal Justice to enhance my knowledge of all of that. And that led to a completely new career that I had never expected it to do, as well as interviewing a lot of forensic professionals, working with FBI profilers, um, becoming very proficient in the world of serial murder, because I covered so many, over 200 cases for the Court TV website, and then became a professor and a researcher and things just snowballed from there so it didn't it wasn't really about setting my path <laughs> it was things happened and i always went okay i'm going to do this next and you you really do a lot i mean you've written what 70 books 71 i'm just finishing 71, 71. <laughs> oh, that's amazing that's awesome i love it i i, I that's awesome and you i mean you have numerous degrees and obviously you teach a bunch of courses at the sales Okay, you've got you've done a lot of work in terms of serial killers, and I see that you've written a, a quite a bit on Richard Chase and a, couple, a few articles on Richard Chase. Well, well, Chase was one of the ones that I covered for the Court TV website. I mean, at the time, I was looking for any case, and I had this great editor who basically said yes to everything. So whoever I wanted to explore became you know, a person that I would then write a usually 10,000 word article for the website that's so exploring in depth. And I think it was, I'm not sure, maybe I had worked a bit with John Douglas, the FBI profiler, and, you know, he talked a lot about the organized versus disorganized offenders, which the FBI doesn't use that anymore. But at the time, it was kind of a big deal to categorize some of the extreme offenders. And Chase really was a very clear uh, example of the disorganized offenders. So when I began teaching a course on extreme offenders, so mass murderers, spree killers, serial killers, Um, He was a good one to use as an example of that particular category. So as a result, I got to know his case really well, but also because I worked a bit with Robert Ressler, who had interviewed Chase. So I kind of came at it through two different maybe three or four different ways. But yeah, I mean, talking with Wrestler about it was, was quite interesting, too, because he had his own perspective on it. It was also a case in which one of the FBI profilers was a bit involved because he had, uh, it was Russ Borpagel, he had taught a case on very early days of FBI profiling, obviously, because that was the late 70s. And so he crossed paths with Biondi, who was the, the lead investigator on the Chase case. So you had a lot of things converging at the time um, that intrigued me. And so the Chase, the Richard Trenton Chase case was a natural for me to work with. And also I went undercover in the vampire subculture. (laughs) So I do a whole lot about that too. And so the Dracula killer or the vampire of Sacramento, as he was variously called, I mean, all of this stuff seemed like a natural for me to look into this case because I had an awful lot of different angles on it that I knew a lot about. Your interest in Susan Walsh, too, right? Well, Tracy. and that led me into the vampire subculture because Susan Walsh went missing. She was investigating the vampire subculture in New York. I had just written Anne Rice's biography and the vampire companion and blah, blah, blah about her books. And so my literary agent said, I bet you could get into that subculture and find out more about what happened to her. So I had a lot of that. So I did know things about clinical vampirism because I I had a colleague who had written a lot of articles about it. And I interviewed a number of mental health professionals who knew a few things about that. Although the vampire subculture was not really about clinical vampirism, still my interests in the field of psychology covered that. And I wrote a bit about that as well. So if we can talk a little bit about the the background of of Richard Chase's case... It seems that as a child, he had a fairly normal upbringing in terms of his parents. I know they bickered quite a bit, and I, you know, I know they eventually got divorced. But it seems like he had a lot of issues, like mental health issues, as a child. That I, I wonder were they ignored uh, by parents, family, because he tortured animals, killed animals. 
I believe, when he was young. Well, he didn't really have a normal upbringing because his mother had a paranoid disorder. So this certainly could be something he inherited from her. She That was one of the reasons they divorced, that she had the, all these delusional thoughts herself. And also, when he did get some help at one point, she weaned him off his antipsychotic medication because she didn't really believe in it. Uh, his father apparently had been, let's just say, a very strict disciplinarian. And Chase himself was kind of a, a weak, sickly kid. I mean, he really thin, always thought of himself as weak to the point where he didn't, when he was of age to get a job, he didn't want to get one because he didn't think he could, he could work, uh, which, you know, then he clashed with his father over that because his father didn't want to support him. You know, with Chase, it's hard to say how much was a serious mental illness that was biologically based and how much was it street drugs that he took because he took an right. awful lot of LSD and other kinds of hallucinogenic drugs, smoked a lot of dope. He certainly had a delusional disorder, no doubt about it, but it was able to still be out I mean, he had been evaluated in various psychiatric institutions, but they didn't hold him. Of course, it was the days of deinstitutionalization. So perhaps in the 1960s, he might have been treated and held for longer periods of time. But during the 1970s, there was a lot of movement to get mental patients out of the institutions and, you know, under the care of their parents if possible. And so his parents did actually accept a conservatorship, but then they kind of did a bad job of it. I mean, they, rather than really supervising him, they got him an apartment that they paid for and his father, I think, would go grocery shopping for him to make sure he had food, but they didn't really supervise him. And at one point, showed up at his mother's house uh, and killed, I think it was her cat, uh, mutilated it. And she just said she she was scared of him and she didn't want him anywhere near her. This is around the same time she took him off the anti-psychotic um, medication. So they made a mess of it. And then she did not renew the conservatorship. So he should have actually gone back to the institution, the asylum, and he did not. Deinstitutionalization was a policy that moved many severely mentally ill patients out of state-run hospitals and allowed for the closure of many public mental health facilities across the United States. A lot of this began in the 1950s with the introduction of antipsychotics. In 1954, the FDA approved the use of an antipsychotic now known as Thorazine to treat mental health illnesses like schizophrenia and bipolar disorder. The idea was that severe mental illness could be cured with these medications. In 1955, there were 558,239 severely mentally ill patients that were in hospitals across the United States. At this time, the U.S. population was only about 164 million. A little more than half of the severely mentally ill patients being released were diagnosed with schizophrenia. Others were diagnosed with bipolar disorder and even Alzheimer's. People were essentially discharged from hospitals and weren't receiving the care and oftentimes the medication that they would have been provided with at public psychiatric facilities. It was thought that these people could be treated in a less restrictive way at home with family and loved ones. Not everybody has family or loved ones that are willing to take care of somebody with severe mental illness. Most people just aren't really equipped to handle that type of situation. The release of mentally ill individuals added to the large number of homeless people across America, as well as an increased incarceration rate. Many will say that there is a direct link between the release of severely mentally ill patients and an increase in homelessness, as well as an increase in incarceration of those with mental health issues. The effects of heavy use of LSD could be similar to the symptoms of schizophrenia. Long-term and frequent use of LSD has been thought of by some researchers to induce a longer period of drug-related hallucinations or even bring about a state of psychosis, especially if there is a genetic predisposition to serious mental health illness. There hasn't been a great deal of studies on the comparison and correlation between LSD and schizophrenia, mainly due to the fact that use of LSD has declined over the decades. 
Not to say that people aren't using the drug. It's just that the amount of people that use the drug have greatly reduced since the 1960s and 70s. So he he's kind of fell between the cracks of people really taking him and making sure he had medication, making sure he's taking care of himself. He didn't really have great supervision for any of that. And as a result, his disorders, his delusions were, you know, kind of ran unchecked. And he had a, you know, we would probably call it clinical vampirism where he thought he needed blood because he had a somatic delusional disorder where he thought all kinds of things were going wrong with him. And this and this is aligned with his mother's paranoid disorder. So he went into medical clinics and said things like his heart has stopped beating or someone had stolen his pulmonary artery or his stomach was backwards or, you know, someone was slicing into his brain. He had all these bizarre ideas and nothing ever showed up on medical tests that there was something physically wrong with him. So those are somatic delusions. And since he wasn't medicated or supervised, it was very easy for him to spin those delusions into the the kind of life that he ended up living, which was killing animals. And what he would do is go to to this farm where he'd get rabbits. And so nobody really knew because his father wasn't paying any attention. Nobody really knew he was doing this. He was buying these rabbits and taking them home and you know, he'd cut their heads off and he'd take all their entrails out and blend them up in a blender and drink that thinking that was good for him. And then one day he injected rabbit blood into his own blood thinking this was a better way to to get the help he needed. He, he thought it was medicinal, thought it was something that was therapeutic. And he got blood poisoning. So at this point, his father, who took him to the hospital, discovered you know what he was up to. Up to that point, they didn't realize that was what he was doing. And he was also grabbing pets from the neighborhood, cats and dogs, worried that his, his he was running out of blood. His blood might be turning to powder, that he was going to die. So like we see with people with delusional disorders and schizophrenia, sometimes is the violence is often a, a reaction. It's a preemptive strike. It's a way to save themselves. So that's what he saw. Uh, he was worried that he was going to run out of animals and his blood was going to turn to powder and, um, you know, he was going to die. So at the point at which, and he also was arrested he, uh, at one point for running around naked with blood all over him. This was in Nevada. And it, it turned out that he had killed a cow and removed the liver and had drank, dr- uh, he had drunk some of the blood, but they didn't arrest him because that, you know, even though that's property damage, it wasn't the crime that they thought it was. So again, we have Chase kind of out there doing these bizarre things, but nobody really stopping him until he finally does get some weapons and he starts shooting randomly into houses. He saw a man uh, on December 29th, 1977, he saw a man out getting groceries out of the back of the car and shot him. His name was Ambrose Griffin and killed him. And he felt good about that because now he was assured that he would have a regular blood supply. When nobody came to get him and it, clearly he had killed somebody, he thought, okay, well, then good. I always have humans. If I can't find animals, I always have humans. At least, at least this is the narrative he had told to some people like Robert Ressler, was that that's why he was doing this, is to basically save his own life. He would go trying door knobs, right? He would go try and, and open doors to see if he can get in the home. That was his story. Was his story he, right. One of the stories he told, <laughs> this kind of fits with the whole vampire idea, oh, is he would go, and he was seen skulking around a lot of neighborhoods, going onto porches, crossing through backyards, and he would try door knobs. And, he, and his narrative was that if it was locked, that meant he wasn't welcome there. But if it was unlocked, he would go in. And there were a couple of houses where he went in, people weren't home, and he defecated or urinated on their property well, and just, yeah. you know, kind of owned the home. We definitely know that Chase had a control disorder. He really wanted to control things. And so this was a way for him to reassure himself that he was in, in charge. And unfortunately for Teresa uh, Wallen, when he found her door unlocked on January 
January 23rd, 1978. He went in, he had a gun. Uh, he put a bullet, a live bullet into her mailbox before he even tested the doorknob. So that was odd. But when the door opened, he saw her taking out her trash and he shot her, I think three times. And she fell down and he dragged her body into the bedroom. He went into the kitchen and found um, either he brought a knife with him or he found a knife in the kitchen. I'm not sure that was ever clarified because the knife wasn't there uh, after they found her body. But he did get sort of around in her trash and found a used yogurt cup. And so when he went back to the body, he he sliced her up, took out her intestines, cut the kidneys out, rearranged things in a kind of odd way, put some of it back inside her. She was three months pregnant. He took the fetus out and kind of sliced into it and then apparently used the yogurt cup to drink her blood. So, you know, very odd stuff. Also, I think went out into the yard. The do- there was a dog in the yard. Went out in the yard, let the dog into the house and scooped up dog feces to stuff into her mouth. So that's not really part of this delusional disorder. So it's unclear what he was doing exactly with all this. Because if all he needed was blood, what was all right. the carving for? I think he was just curious. Once he had a body, he wanted to see what the intestines look like. Yeah, it was just sort of experimental. You know, it was an odd guy, no doubt about it. And he was interested in human organs. So that's what happened to her as a result of her not having her door locked. And people saw him in the neighborhood. There were witness reports, but nobody knew who he was. They knew, he was this tall, gangly, uh, long. he had long brown hair and he he wore this orange parka. It was black pants and tennis shoes. But so there were a number of sightings of the same person, but nobody knew who he was. And that until a few days later. But initially, when police questioned people um, after her hus- after Teresa's husband found the body, um, they couldn't really figure out any leads or who this was. Aside from some people who said, you know, somebody broke in came into our house and defecated and urinated on our clothing and and tried to steal a decorative sword. So he wasn't able to do that, but he apparently made the attempt. And so that was a mystery for about four days. And then Evelyn Mira, he entered her home, he apparently first shot a male friend who was visiting her, Dan Meredith, and he was shot in the hallway. Chase, I'm not sure what he did, but he turned the body over. So it had been moved. He didn't just shoot him and move on. He had handled him in some way. He then also killed Evelyn and he did some of the same mutilations with her, only he also sodomized her and um, stabbed her in the anus a number of times. Uh, But he did open her up, you know, in the same way he did with Teresa Wallen. Oh, tried to cut out her eye. I remember that part. It was pretty brutal. And also her six-year-old son, Jason, was on the other side of the bed where Chase had done this to Evelyn. So he had been shot and he was was, he was also dead. And then they saw a crib with a bullet hole through a pillow and looked like some blood, but no baby was there. Only a little bit later, when the baby's mother came to collect uh, her son, did they realize that there had been a, a toddler there as well who was now gone. And it was really hard to reconstruct this scene, but it, they thought maybe he had shot the baby I think 20 months old. So he had shot this child, seemed to have banged its head against the sink in the bathroom and then took took the child. So they also took Dan Meredith's red car and they found that abandoned about a mile away. So that was another clue. Again, this is, and this is before DNA. Nobody has any ideas about any of this. And it seemed that Chase had or the the offender, the person who did this, had worn gloves because they weren't able to find fingerprints. So that was important as well. Is that and that became a big issue in terms of the his psychotic disorder because if he wore gloves, he clearly knew, you know, he was trying to hide the fact that he was doing these things. So now they had this horrible massacre essentially in this quiet neighborhood of these four people. 
And not, you know, all of them were 22 caliber bullets. And also there was another home that had been shot into. Nobody was hurt, but it was clear that somebody was running around shooting people seemingly with the same gun. And, you know, who was this person? And the big break came when a woman, a young woman on the 20, on uh, January 28th told police that she had run into this guy she knew from high school, Richard Chase. And he was really incoherent and said some really odd things. And she had seen him in a store where Teresa Wallen had been cashing a check. And so she thought maybe she should tell police that she had seen him there because she'd heard about this this murder in the same area. And it turns out he lived within walking distance of all the crime scenes. And so then they, they went to his apartment. He wouldn't let them in. So they they backed away and waited. He emerges in this orange parka that all these witnesses had described. He looked exactly like everybody had described this weird guy skulking around. And in the box, he had oh, he had uh, Dan Meredith's wallet in his pocket. He had bloody paper towels and newspapers in the box. A few other items that were incriminating. And so. Uh, he was put under arrest, but they couldn't find the baby. In his apartment, they found dog collars, <laughs> not no dogs, but dog collars. They found, um, there used to be these things called transparencies from medical textbooks. And there, and on the coffee table, there were a number of human organ transparencies. He had a calendar that seemed to be marked for when he was going to go on and kill, although that was never clarified. But uh, certainly on the day that Teresa Wallen died, on the day that El Evelyn Miroth and her son and her friend died, those dates were marked on the calendar with these circles. And apparently, if we're to believe Chase, he said that his blood, he, he suffered from soap dish poisoning. Each day he would pick up the soap and decide if it were dry, he would be okay. If it were wet, that meant that his blood was turning to powder and he needed to go kill somebody, somebody who had blood to save himself. However, if he's doing that and not knowing from one day to the next, why were these circles on the calendar? There were, I think, something like 44 circles into the future. So that wow. kind of contradicts the story that this yeah. is soap dish poisoning. So we don't know how much he just made up when he's sitting around in prison or you know, whatever. But clearly, they did find blood stained items everywhere in his apartment, glasses, a blender, plates. They found pieces of skull. They found pieces of human organs you know, in the refrigerator. Ugh. It was really disgusting. It stank. Obviously, his parents had not taken their supervision very seriously because they obviously didn't know how he was living at all. Um, but he would not give up any details about the baby. And finally, it was a church janitor who found a mummified body, beheaded body in a box. Um, the head was underneath the body. And the uh, car keys from Dan Meredith's car were also in this box. So it was pretty clear this was the missing baby. It was a couple, like into March before um, they found it. So it was a pretty horrifying case. And Chase was charged with six murders. And they found the baby like at the, on the church grounds? It was in a box. It must have been because the janitor, it was a church janitor that found yeah. it. And the thing I find interesting is that the first thing he did was shoot people. It's like as if he just wanted to get the killing over with so that he could get to the next step in, in whatever his process was, which. Well, that very... wasn't the first because the first thing he did was kill animals. He I killed rabbits, he killed a cow, he killed yeah. pets in the neighborhood. Yeah. He tried all of that and he started to worry that he was, first of all, not he didn't have money, so he couldn't buy the rabbits anymore. Right. Uh, he was running out of pets in the neighborhood. And it was only when he decided to see if he could shoot somebody that he began to feel like, oh, okay, I have a pretty good supply here of human beings, so no problem. I, I meant like in his process, so like, you know, in terms of killing humans, it's like the first thing he did immediately was just kind of like kill them so that it, that's out of the way. And then. Well, yeah, I guess he could have hung thing. out with the vampire cults and asked <laughs> if he could just drink their blood. <laughs> I mean, that probably would have been a lot easier, honestly. He could have just worked at a hospital and then got 
blood somehow but um he, yeah he, i think he, i think the idea was that he needed it to yeah. be like a pumping kind of, kind of blood right. like in Live. a living like, being i don't know that his delusions were all that coherent um but i do remember at one point um he was in in one of the psychiatric institutions and you know they they sort of have a nickname for him um they called him dracula and renfield and whatnot and at one point they found these two birds with broken necks and blood around his mouth so that's so it, it seemed that he needed these living creatures to, I don't know why, I think it, and maybe often uh, clinical vampirism has a sexual component. He blamed all of this on erectile dysfunction. So it might very well be that he had evolved into a, a sort of blood fetish that gave him some kind of arousal mechanism that he wasn't able to complete without it. We don't know that, but we do know that often clinical vampirism has been a very sexual kind of thing. Yeah, I remember hearing uh, when he was a teenager, he had girlfriends, but he had trouble performing. Right. And so he went to go see a psychiatrist, I believe. Yeah, he had trouble with that. I don't think it was taken very seriously. He did develop a lot of resentment and anger around it. He did sodomize uh, one of the victims. So it does seem that maybe he was able to complete the act with the blood, you know, the presence of a body he was mutilating and carving up. And maybe that's what he needed to get aroused. We definitely have paraphilias of that nature. They're called coercive paraphilias. They're often criminal in nature. Most paraphilias are not criminal, but paraphilias are sexual deviances where a person needs an object or an experience or, you know, something like that to get aroused. So pedophilia, you need children. Fetishes involving sh high-heeled shoes or or female underwear or there's there's one book that lists over two thousand paraphilias. <laughs> so vampirism is one, cannibalism is one, feces and urine. Some people need that to get aroused. And I would see Chase since he had this this erectile dysfunction issue and was pretty angry about it. That if he was chasing down blood, I don't think it was really just all about preserving his own blood from turning to powder, I think it was a way for him to get sexually aroused. Have you seen this in other serial killer that have had like a vampirism component? There have been. There's a guy, Joshua Rudiger, I think, uh, was killing people in San Francisco, homeless people in San Francisco. Um, some survived, but he definitely killed some. I mean, I've seen them in single murderers like James Reba, who killed his grandmother, and we've seen people who claim vampires order them to kill people and drink their blood. So I've seen that. I've seen a double homicide involving a vampire thing. But clinical vampirism doesn't typically involve murder. It's tip more typically they just need blood. They think they need blood. It's a psychological issue. They don't physically have to have have to drink blood, but they have a psychological need for it. Um, but typically they don't need to kill somebody to get it. And so anyone who's doing that is taking it to an extreme. So I, I wouldn't say it's common, but it, I've seen it uh, in some of the serial killers. And it seems like Chase is not as widely known as other serial killers. And your books have really brought that to the forefront. So why do you think Chase is not as widely known? And why do you think you really had to put his name out there? I don't know that I'm the one who did. I think Biondi's the one who did, and Robert Ressler is the one who did. Um, I know about him through what they wrote. I think there's there are a few other, there's some articles, there's some other books about him now. But, you know, it, psychotic serial killers are not that sexy. People want, you know, we've been trained by media to expect certain sexiness in our serial killers, and that, and so they might find chase fleetingly interesting because it's it's gory and and icky but he's not going to have the kind of star status that Dahmer who you know did cannibal things or or Bundy or Night Stalker Ramirez or you know he, he's not going to get that star status because he was a skinny scrawny smelly guy who didn't have much going for him a real loser type and he's just not that I mean, he's interesting clinically. He's not that interesting to the true crime community as as a superstar serial killer. I mean, his victims seem to be more random. Many other serial killers actually have like a 
a type, right? They have like a particular type of person that they go after. Some do. That's a myth, actually. Really? Okay. Wow. (laughs) Yeah, there's lots of myths out there about serial killers. Yeah, we definitely want to dispel any myths about serial killers. Yeah, yeah, Um, lots of them. The ones who are sexually compelled will tend to have a type because they're looking for a distinct thing that arouses them, like Bundy, like college girls, because it made him feel like he was on their level. So there's there's a couple of serial killers who liked redheads, for example. But I think if you look at serial killers as a whole, we're talking about thousands of people who've been documented. You'll see a lot of random killings, a lot, especially if they're shot. Lots of randomness, lots of opportunists, rather than uh, people who are ter- doing it ritually. And even uh, sometimes you'll see a mission killer, for example, might only be taking sex workers. Well, that doesn't mean he has a victim type. It's only because they're sex workers and he feels he has a mission. Or they might go after sex workers just because they're easy to get into a car with somebody wow. by luring them with money. So sometimes we think that's a victim type when it's not really a victim type. It's just a it's just an easy type. It's hard to dispel the myths because they've kind of been with us since the yeah. 1970s and 80s. Um, but those myths were based on s- studies that were poorly designed, very small samples, unrepresentative, and they got into textbooks. And so that's the unfortunate way that the myths were spread. But lots of killers don't have a distinct victim type. And even if they do, like Bundy would sometimes act on opportunity. Wasn't even you know, like a 12-year-old girl was not his type, Kimberly Leach. There she was walking across her high her high school can or junior high campus and he had a stolen van and he had and he just grabbed her so wasn't looking for someone like that but she was alone and so he just acted on an opportunity and that's what we have to keep in mind that even if they have a type they'll break type mm-hmm. if they see you know something else and they're in the mood and they have their murder kit with them they'll do that and when it comes to the mental health of them I think people look at Chase as being more psychotic and not so much as being like a calculating yes. psychopathic yes. Right. <laughs> predatory. So, right. Well, so like, yeah. there there's such a thing as a schizopath, um, <laughs> a psychopathic person with also with schizophrenia, and I think Chase would be that person. That's not in the DSM, but that's kind of a a label some people use. But you know, I'll just say some some things about how they prepared for his trial because you'll see the confusing nature of all this. Again, we we had talked about Chase taking street drugs. So how and even one psychiatrist said, I don't know how much of this is his brain scrambled on some kind of psychotic, you know, episode that hasn't quit, or it's the schizophrenia or, you know, some kind of genetic legacy from his mother who had a paranoid disorder. It's hard to say. We don't really know. To this day, we don't have a formula to make for making distinctions between biological conditions and environmental influences. But Chase definitely knew the prosecutor was faced with this, and he was going for the death penalty. So he was faced with, how do I convince people that even if he were psychotic, he still could be found sane? And that's something that people don't understand. Insanity is a legal term. And it means that that, uh, if you're insane, it means you have a mental disease or defect that prevents you from understanding that what you're doing is wrong or prevents you from being able to comport your behavior with what you know to be wrong and right and wrong. So Chase Wearing the gloves suggests he knew he didn't want to leave fingerprints, which suggests he knew that if he were caught, there'd be legal consequences. So he could still have a delusional disorder and be considered sane because he took those precautions. He came in with a gun, but he did it in the middle of the day where he could have easily been seen. Uh, he walked up to a woman he knew and started bab, you know, just rambling about some of this. So clearly, maybe he really didn't. But when police came, he wouldn't let them in as if he knew something was, you know, that they wanted something he didn't want them to see. And then he tried uh, taking this stuff out of his apartment when he thought they weren't there, that he knew was incriminating. So these are things that indicate he did understand that what he did was wrong that murder is not okay. Very different from another psychotic individual, Ed Gein, who actually talked about having Bernice Warden at his house, who openly thought what he had done was 
okay and really did not have a sense of appreciation for the fact that killing these these two women and digging up graves and whatnot was wrong. He definitely was a psychotic individual. He never had any kind of treatment because he had, and was raised by this weirdly religious mother who, and was very sheltered and, and really didn't have any kind of, of oversight at all in his behavior once his father, mother, and brother were dead. So he's a case where they actually did consider, you know, he really just doesn't get that this is wrong. That is not like Chase. Chase did seem to understand it. He did understand what the police were doing at his door, and he did try to hide the evidence by dumping the stuff in a box and walking out with it to get rid of it. So in the end, the jury didn't take long, it took about five hours for them to convict him of the six homicides as first degree murder, calculated, thought out, planned murder, and he got the death penalty. So you talk about clinical vampirism and, you know, in some of these cases, there's vampirism and cannibalism mixed together. Is that common or is this and Rod Farrell's case quite different from other people who have vampirism? Well, Rod Farrell's case is very different from uh, what was going on. He killed uh, the Wendorfs to free their daughter. <laughs> Not really... He didn't kill them as victims that he wanted to drink their blood or, I mean, that it wasn't a vampire killing. It was, he was the leader of a little vampire group and he wanted to spring Heather and, you know, to go with them. So he killed her parents. That's a very different kind of murder from something like Jeffrey Dahmer, who wants to drill holes into to people's heads and turn them into sex slave zombies. And once they're dead, fries up some of their parts to see what they taste like. He turned out he didn't really like cannibalism. Um, so even though he's called the cannibal killer, he didn't really cannibalize people that much. He did preserve body parts. Um, he did preserve uh, skeletons and skulls and whatnot. But according to his narrative, he didn't really eat them very much. And I don't believe he was like a blood drinker. But it, it isn't really that unusual to find those two practices together. Because often if you have the mindset that you're imbibing your victim uh, as a way to control them to or take them into you, to fuse with them um, blood and, you know, internal organs and lips and ears and whatever you're eating, you know, amount to about the same thing. So you, you could take someone like, I'm trying to think of that German cannibal, what is his name? Armin Weiss. So he advertised for someone to come to his place and want to be cannibalized because his big sexual fetish was to eat, cannibalize somebody. And he had a number of people answer the ad, but most of them backed out. But one guy didn't. And that is what he wanted. He wanted to have his parts consumed by another person. And he signed forms. This is assisted suicide, essentially. He yeah. signed forms saying this. He was, and we videotaped him to make sure everybody knew this is a consenting adult who, this is what he wanted, what they both wanted. Uh, and they proceeded to, you know, get kind of drunk and to dine on his body parts together until he finally died from loss of blood. That's a different kind of cannibalism than what you have from Chase. But certainly there would have been probably some blood drinking involved in that as well, because there's, there's kind of a, a ceremonial aspect to it, a ritual. And Chase, too, had a few odd rituals. But I think for him, and again, we don't know how much of his narrative that he told Wrestler, for example, is just something he made up while he was sitting around in, in a jail cell or really was something he calculated. But he did talk about, you know, I needed this to survive. And we, we absolutely have documentation of him going into medical clinics and saying, my brain isn't working right. My heart is stopping. My you know stomach is turned upside down. We have those somatic delusions documented. Um, so it could very well be he believed his blood was disappearing and he was going to die and that drinking blood from living creatures, including humans, was the only way to save his life. It's possible. He really believed that. And ironically, when they did the autopsy after he killed himself uh, in his prison cell with a drug overdose, um, his heart was fine. 
It's a delusional disorder. I mean, he also had a whole disorder about aliens. He believed, you know, the aliens were coming for him, and he believed that the uh, guards were trying to poison him. He asked Robert Ressler to please take the cup and test it in the FBI lab to make sure. So the fact that we know his mother had a paranoid disorder suggests he inherited this from her, because that's all paranoia. Do you think the system failed him then? The 1970s mental health system failed a lot of people, lots of people. I could go on and on, especially in California, because they were completely shutting down group homes, mental health facilities, trying to believe that the communities would take care of, of their mentally ill people. But the funds never got to the right places, and many of these people fell through the cracks uh, were street people. I mean, Chase at least had his parents paying for an apartment for him. But uh, yeah, the system failed him utterly. And um, But also, it's not clear he would have uh, benefited from help anyway because he was a control freak. He didn't want anyone telling him what to do. He wanted to do things himself. He believed he could do things himself. And I mean, he didn't resist his mother weaning him off his antipsychotic medication. He could have said, no, no, I this is something I need. Uh, he just went along with it. And you know, he had a lot of personality disorders that are not about being psychotic. And I think those personality disorders would have probably resisted anything a mental health system could have done for him. But you couple that with the mess that was going on in the 1970s with deinstitutionalization, especially starting in California. You know, Herbert Mullen is another one during that era. Uh, same same deal. He had a psychotic disorder and he killed 13 people, believing he was justified in doing it. And a lot of it, was, again, he also took street drugs, but he also had schizophrenia. He also did not get any care or supervision. And yeah, I think I think you can definitely hold the mental health system at that time partially responsible for what happened with Chase. A recent case that comes to my mind is one that happened in Canada. I believe it was, I believe it was Edmonton, where there was a man on a bus, and no. he started stabbing the man, and he decapitated him and started, can, you know, cannibalized him. And he got, I believe he was put into a mental hospital, and he was released, I believe, in 2015, which... um. You know, I guess the argument is, the question really is, is somebody really rehabilitated? Are they able to function on their own after they've done something like that? Would that, would it be possible that they could then do something like that again? They certainly could do something like that again. Usually there are committees that make these decisions about releasing them and about their condition and what was going on at time. I question what was going on in that bus. It's not, you don't just behead somebody in two seconds that clearly something was happening that nobody was intervening. But I, I know that people are, are still held for long periods of time, sometimes longer than their actual sentence would have been had they been convicted rather than held in, a, in some kind of psychiatric facility. So it's going to depend. On, I can't give you any kind of generalization about that. I don't know how that guy's doing. Uh, I don't know if he's had any other behavioral issues since then. Maybe he's okay. I haven't heard anything in the news, but it was a pretty horrifying case, absolutely. But I'm sure when they made the decision to release him, it, they took a lot of factors into account. And I don't know what they were, so I really can't make a comment on the decision. I'm curious how you yourself would define the term vampire. I, I don't think Richard Chase ever described himself as a vampire. No, I don't think he did either. Yeah. <laughs> um, I don't know. I, I mean, I wrote a whole book about that in the end and said, I don't know what it is. <laughs> it's whatever you want it to be, apparently. <laughs> so, I mean, I grew up on Dracula and all this, so I, I think I know what a vampire is. Right. But then I met lots and lots of people in the vampire subculture who completely redefined it. And who's to say? There's no authority saying, oh, no, it has to be this. Lots of people were stretching the concept every which way of psychic vampires versus sanguinary vampires or uh, nice vampires. <laughs> you know, <laughs> you know it, at the end of that two years in the subculture, and then I, I did an additional book called The Science of Vampires, I, all I could say was, 
I'm not the authority on how to define this. I know what I like in the vampire <laughs> literature. I know what I don't like, but I'm certainly not going to tell other people what a vampire is or isn't. But clinical vampirism is a psychological disorder where a person believes they need to have blood to survive and proceeds to take it in some manner, usually from other human beings or from blood banks or something like that, when they don't genuinely need it physiologically. So that's not hard to define. I just can't define the mythical vampire for you or even say they're just mythical because I know plenty of people think they're real. Yeah. I I always say if somebody thinks that they're a vampire, then sure. Believe them. You're you're a vampire. Hey, it worked for me when I was writing that book. I got lots of great (laughs) stories. Um, So I just nod and listen. And, you know, how, how did you get to that? I love characters. My writing requires characters. So. Uh, I love it when people have their narratives, because what I want to know is how did you get there? Why that? Why the vampire? And sometimes not the vampire, it's the vampire hunter or the vampire victim or some other aspect of the mythos that they identify with and find some kind of empowerment from. I mean, I loved going to the vampire clubs um, and meeting some of the the various uh, practice people who are doing these, these different practices. They were great. I had a blast. It's one of my favorite books I've written. Was that like an ethnography, you know, going into and researching and understanding the vampire subculture of New York City? Was it New York City? Oh, I didn't stay in New York. I went a lot of places. You went all over? I started in New York. (laughs) So I started in New York. And from there, I met people who said, oh, you need to go here, you need to go here. I went to Paris and London and Las Vegas and Houston and Los, Los Angeles and Seattle and New Orleans and Savannah. I, I met people all over the place, actually. It was a blast, I, had a, I have to say. And I acquired a ring from one of the vampires who said it was haunted by a ghost of a vampire. The How could I not haunted. take it? The ring itself <laughs> so- is haunted? The ring was haunted by the ghost of a vampire who committed suicide to become more powerful as a ghost. Hey, that's a great tale. And, and this, this does not have anything to do with like uh, Vampire the Masquerade game or anything. Right? This is solely well, it does because it was at it does, the okay. time Vampire the Masquerade was a very big game, yeah. and kin- the ki- Kindred the Embraced was a TV show. Uh, And there are a lot of role-playing games, a lot of LARPs, live action role-playing games where we, like I went to the cloisters in New York to play a LARP. Um, I did everything that people wanted to do. I didn't drink anyone's blood myself or let anyone do anything to me, but I went to an S&M party that was all vampires. (laughs) I went uh, to bloodletting sports uh, by vampire, run by, sponsored by vampires. It was an amazing experience for me to see how people were getting involved in this subculture. There were tens of thousands. It was huge. It was international. It, no longer is that the case, but at, during the uh, late 1990s, it was, uh, it was massive. What do you wow. mean no longer the case? What happened? I think that people got tired of, some got tired of the role playing, some got tired of the media exploitation because there was a lot of that. Some grew up (laughs) and just said, I don't want to do this anymore. I'm going to go get a job and be. (laughs) I mean, there's, there's certainly a lot of people out there, but it's nothing like it was back then. Nothing like it was. And you also got vampires tamed, like, um, I'm just going to say it. That where the vampires go to high school. What's that one? Um, B- a big, big, show. big vamp. What? Uh, the sh- like a, sh- a show? Yeah, yeah. The no- novels, and then oh, and then oh, it became oh. movies. Twilight? Yeah, that's it. Gotcha. Gotcha. Where the vampires got tamed down a bit. Like, what vampire goes <laughs> to high school? They don't have and to. They, and they shimmer in the sun. <laughs> and shimmery, and the werewolves, um. and so to me, that kind of defanged right. it in a way. Even no though it was scary at that point, it wasn't scary. Yeah, but but then you know, Anne Rice's vampires really weren't scary either. No, they that weren't, she yeah. had the whole romantic thing. But what was going on with when Anne Rice was gaining popularity was also Stephen King. Interview the Vampire and Salem's Lot came out yeah. right around the same time. 
So different people moved in the rice direction, which was the romanticism and the sorrowing, guilty vampire with a soul. And Salem's Lot went in a different direction. But even so, by the end of the 90s into the 2000s, the whole vampire phenomenon had uh, depleted quite a bit. It's interesting because um, Chandi and I were talking I think it was like last week or something. And and I had mentioned a particular like documentary that I had seen on the history channel years ago. And um, it was vampire secrets, which you were also, you were also in. And um, I told her to watch it just cause she didn't know much about vampire, <laughs> <laughs> but it came out in 2006. So yeah, it was definitely like the tail end of, of any like vampire scene. Yeah. And it isn't that, I mean, certainly vampire literature movies still, attract an audience but the live action role playing does not yeah. a lot of that just went away and that yeah, was absolutely. partly the way people went to the parties i mean the parties were amazing the people spent thousands of dollars on their wardrobes uh, i mean the creativity that i witnessed was was so impressive and it was a way for people to just act out through a role I know some of the people from those days are still practicing vampires. And they still keep in touch with me. I have a lot of people on Facebook who are part of that subculture. All I'm saying it was it's greatly diminished from what it used to be. But the the hardcore people are still around and they've been doing it for decades. And they know how to throw a party. <laughs> <laughs> Do you miss it? Do you miss that scene? It was really fun at the time. I guess once I got into forensics, you know, that was a whole different form of really interesting things that people do. And so, no, I guess I don't miss it. I guess that's it. <laughs> that's a way of saying that. And I'd talk to my, my associates from those days from time to time, but I probably wouldn't go to another Vampire Valentine's Day ball or something like that. Wow. Seems like they really, um, really partied back then. It, it reminds me of like the goth scene, which is like probably not as big as it once was. They like, came the too. Time. The yeah. goths were there. The werewolves were there. The shapeshifters were there. The Sorry, witches were there. They all came together. We had one of yeah shapeshifters, people who claim they can shift into wolves or bear or something like that. Mm -hmm. There was a whole, in fact, they wanted me to write a book about them. It wasn't enough of them to sustain yeah, a book. But yeah, they, I mean, the vampire scene was the scene that all the marginalized people okay. came to because you could be who you wanted to be. Uh, vampires already dressed in black for the most part or rubber or velvet or, you know, whatever. Yes, yeah, so everybody else, S&M and, and. Yeah, they all fit in. They all did. fit in. It was a very fluid, blendable subculture. And then they began to drift apart. And grow up. But yeah, when I went, the, like the, we had a, a place in New York called Mother. Uh, it was a club, and uh, all of those different people came. The Vampire Valentine's Day Ball that I just mentioned, where 800 people were there. It was amazing. It was amazing. And it was all different kinds of people. Goths did not like being called vampires, but they didn't <laughs> mind mingling with them if they were throwing the party. Catherine, I know you, you've, like I said before, you've written, at this point, 71 books. Yep. Um, can you tell us about your latest writing? <laughs> <laughs> I am well I did spend five years with the BTK serial killer writing his uh, guided autobiography and I recently completed another one with a serial killer's accomplice uh, but I can't really say a lot about that until it gets through editing and whatnot but the fun thing that I've been doing is uh, a novel series featuring a forensic psychologist who runs a PI agency called the Nutcrackers because they take on hard nuts to crack and often the cases that I use are real cases with really twisty weird demented things that people do and so my team, Annie Hunter is my psychologist. They chase down these cases and I'm having a blast. It's fiction, but I use a lot of nonfiction elements and it's based a lot on some of the teams in forensics that I've worked with. Like some of her, her core team, two of the three of them are real, based on real people. And some of the situations she gets herself into are actual things that happen to me. 
So it's fun. I'm having a blast. The first one is called I Scream Man. Like ice cream. I oh, nice. scream man. <laughs> so, That's funny. You you did say defang before, so you're you're kind of punny. <laughs> <laughs> well, that one came actually from an encounter with a what did she call herself? She was a a psychic who did therapy with ghosts. So, and that was all real. We started talking and the ice cream man sort of spun off of that <laughs> encounter. So that encounter is in, in the first novel and it sounds fictiony, but it's all real, real people. Is this your first venture into fiction? No, I wrote two vampire novels based on my looking for Susan Walsh. And although I wrote Pierce in the Darkness based on the actual immersion in the subculture, I then fictionalized what had happened to Susan Walsh in two vampire novels. <laughs> so that was my first fiction. And then I also have written two urban fantasy, also involving vampires, but vampire angels. Oh, so that's get, that's different. We gotta get our listeners <laughs> reading these books. Our listeners really have to tell you guys pick up these books. We Seriously. just have a entire it, list, seventy one. Especially, <laughs> especially the BTK biography. You have to read that. That was intense. I <laughs> I have never spent. I mean, I I wrote Anne Rice's biography and Dean Koontz's biography, so I knew what it was like to really immerse in a person's life, but. That was long and very involved. I still talk to him. I've been talking to him for 12 years now. In fact, wow. I'll be talking to him on Sunday. But wow, that was unexpected, but I made the most of it. How is he in conversation? Like, is he just, I mean, it's like a normal, yeah, regular, wow. Well, he watches the news, so he likes to talk about the news. He likes okay. to talk about himself. He'll talk about crime cases. He'll, yeah, we talk about weather, moon, the moon phases, <laughs> all kinds of things. We used to play chess. We stopped doing that. But yeah, it's, it's actually pretty easy to talk to him. I hitchhiked across the country when I was 18. Wow. Then when I was 19, That's I bought a motorcycle and rode across the country. I wound up in Wyoming and then Oregon and then Arizona. I ended up going to school for no particular reason. <laughs> and it changed my life. Because I never wanted to go to school again out of high school. And now I have five really? graduate degrees. So something changed and it changed in Arizona. Then wow. I came to the East Coast. And I think you have a degree in philosophy from Rutgers? I have a PhD in philosophy and I taught philosophy for 15 years at Rutgers University. I, had, I liked it. I enjoyed it. But then I left to go to John Jay College of Criminal Justice to get this master's in forensic psychology. Changed everything. So when you were at like a family party or something, when you were eight and someone asked you, Catherine, what do you want to be when you grow up? It wasn't, I want to be a forensic psychologist. I never this. thought about doing that, but I was told I was a philosopher very young. And I didn't know if they were insulting me or what, because <laughs> <laughs> I didn't know what they were talking about. But very young, I was told I was a philosopher, but I really had aspired to be an artist. The first thing I wanted to do was be an athlete. Then I broke oh. my arm and leg. And my 15th birthday, and that was the end of my athletic career. Then I wanted to be an artist, which I still do, but the writing grabbed me. Did never, I never aspired to be a writer. Really? At no point. And then all of a sudden, uh, and actually the first book I wrote, I hated it. <laughs> and I never wanted to write another one. And the second book I wrote, I hoped I'd never do anything but write the rest of my life. And, and that was Anne Rice's writing. biography. So that was the second one you wrote? Yeah. Yeah, that's very <laughs> that's... <laughs> I My philosophy off. is go for it. Better to be told no than to lose an opportunity you might get if you ask. And I called her up and asked, and she said wow. yes. So. That, changed, that shifted my sense of what I wanted to do because I really enjoyed that process of writing. And I wrote seven books with her, so that kind of set my direction. And no matter what I'm doing as a professor or an assistant provost, which I am, the writing takes precedence over everything. I will spend all of my downtime writing. And if anyone were to say, choose, no problem, writing. Yeah, you're constantly writing. I just like there's articles All on the psychology time. today. Like it's just yeah. 
Yeah. That's I love amazing. it. It's it's creative, it's enlarging, empowering, exploratory. I don't like to write stuff I already know. I like to write things that I learn. So writing helps me to learn. And I loved, I have to say, my crime library editor was so wonderful to work with because if I just said, I want to write about Richard Trenton Chase, okay, okay, then move on. And I'd write it and I get paid by Court TV for it. And I, oh my God, this is amazing. And I, of the 800 stories they wrote, I did one quarter of them. And they had a lot of other writers, but I did the majority of the stories. So I, I'm thankful to her. And and at the point at that point, CSI came and I I said to an <laughs> one of my editors, my cemetery stories editor, we need to get a book on this. It maybe three episodes had had shown CSI Las Vegas. He said, no, 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 it's nah. I said yes. And so another editor asked my agent, do you know anyone who could write a, a proposal about this show? And my agent called and I said, yes, I can. I'm ready. And they said, could you write it in an hour? Yes, I can. Can you write the book in three months? Yes, I can. <laughs> and I did. <laughs> I did because I already was writing forensic science for Court TV. So I had a leg up and I knew this was going to be huge. And it was. I was absolutely right about that. So I was well-placed. And I am bold. Yes, yeah. I can do this. And that shifted that book itself, The Forensic Science of CSI. No, I think it was called, I think it was just called The Science of CSI. Shifted everything that I was going to do toward that. I also, I think I wrote The Science of Vampires for the same publisher right around the same time because I could do whatever I wanted with it. It was great fun. But I, I stuck with forensic science and it's such a great field to explore because the things that people think of to do to one another are just, and to themselves, because I'm also in the field of suicidology. What they think of is astonishing. So I'm endlessly fascinated by these narratives. And now with my writing, I can use them, especially in the fiction, and I'm having a blast with that. You've had an amazing career and and, and you're still doing amazing things. <laughs> Thank like, you. Seriously, it's with forensic science, since you've done so much, what is one topic or one area that you want to research more? Well, one that I am researching more for the second novel, which I'm just finishing up, is forensic meteorology. Because I love weather and and all the stuff that you that how weather impacts so many different things and sometimes it impacts criminal acts. And so I'm really interested in forensic meteorology, and I created a character who's a forensic meteorologist. So she comes on the scene with all this cool technology that I've never used before. So I get to explore that. That's been really a lot of fun. And that will also show up in the third novel, which I'm I'm just now beginning to start. So that's, an, that's a field hardly anyone's even heard of. But yeah. <laughs> again, endlessly fascinating because... Uh, weather impacts so many things. And this is just weather, including natural disasters or? Well, the first novel was a hurricane and it wasn't the hurricane itself. It's the flooding, the surge that comes after a hurricane that put my characters in, <laughs> a, in desperate straits because they needed to get something from a cemetery before it got flooded. Um, the second one will have a tornado. Uh, and that tornado, in fact, is even called Damage Path because we learn about tornadoes from the damage path they leave. That's how we learn about serial killers. Perfect metaphor. So I think whether whether it's natural disaster or simply, you know, a rain event or lightning, like I'm going to have a lightning survivors group as as characters. <laughs> So there's so many things, you know, like somebody could be murdered, but it's winter and they get frozen in a snowbank and then they don't even know where the person was. And then suddenly the th snow thaws and now, wow, that really impacts how you're going to be able to investigate that. I mean, like the perfect murder weapon is is those icicles that, you know, you break it off, stab the person, it melts, you got no murder weapon, right? <laughs> oh, that's <laughs> That's <smart>. weather. <laughs> 
One question is just to circle back to Chase is, would you have liked to have met him? He sounded kind of like, uh, trying to be delicate here, but <laughs> he didn't sound like a very pleasant person to talk to because he dehumanized people. He was very narcissistic, antisocial, paranoid. He might have been interesting in a limited way. Like I wouldn't have wanted to get to know him outside the prison because I think he'd be a real annoying pest type of person. But within the prison, if I had limited interview space, I think he could be interesting. But given his mental state, fascination would have its limits because I think it's more interesting to Look at someone like Raider with with a seemingly completely normal childhood and no abuse and none of the things that have become the formula. And how did he get to this point? I think that's a lot more interesting than somebody with a, a delusional disorder whose behavior grows out of the delusion in a way that's pretty predictable. And so I, I think Chase, while interesting, would have lost that fascination for me pretty quickly. You feel like there wouldn't be much of a conversation? I think he would converse because he because he did talk a lot to wrestler. Um, you don't know if it's true. <laughs> well, you don't know. And that doesn't matter. That's never mattered yeah, to me. Yeah. <laughs> I actually, I, you know, when I'm in the vampire subculture, how much <laughs> of that was true? Tell me. <laughs> uh, that doesn't, that's not my criteria. But I think it would have been kind of interesting to see how he'd spin things, but because he had the paranoid disorder, it just becomes too predictable, I think. I mean, the one thing, though, about just going back to to Chase's murders is that um, he really brutalized women and not so much the men. Is there a reason? To I don't think that's true. That boy... Well, that baby boy sure, was probably sure, just the baby yeah, was yeah. horribly treated. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, he, he definitely mutilated the female bodies. And he didn't really talk much about that to anybody. I mean, I assume that there's some anger at his mother. Uh, you know, he's he took the cat and I think it was her cat mutilated it in front of her and I think hurt her dog. Yeah, as far as I know, he never did anything like that to his father. So we'd have to imagine there were some issues with his mother. Some people, there were some stories that said she had uh, beat him uh, or that his father had beat him. I think I think his past history is unclear because the stories contradict each other. But I almost think the women are more of a curiosity to him. because. When he when he mutilated Teresa Wallen, so he cut her up. He took the he said did this with um, Evelyn too. Took the intestines out like he wanted to examine them. Like he didn't beat her up. He didn't. He just shot her. Now he had the body. He did the mutilation. He removed her kidneys. Put them back in with Evelyn. He was trying to remove one of her eyes. So you almost think. It could be that, that they're curiosities. And also, I think he was angry at women because he, he had this erectile dysfunction and he would blame the women for that, um, as men tend to do. They don't have to be delusional and psychotic to, to blame women for, for some kind of erectile inability. Um, other serial killers have done the same thing and they didn't have any psychotic disorder, but they punished the women and blamed them for um, their inability to stay hard or perform. Uh, so I would think that there's something like that, that women are kind of exotic. Uh, now he had a dead body. We do find that what we call disorganized offenders or offenders with some kind of mental illness uh, disorder tend to mutilate the bodies afterward. They And they do things like bite them or do Sta unnecessary stabbing or overkill. And it could just be curiosity, but he didn't really give us much of a narrative on that. So I don't know. How do you take care of yourself? Because you deal with a lot of intense situations. I mean, 
the way you talk about the mutilation, is that something that you can just, have you had to practice that? Because I guess I, I'm, I'm immersed in this every day. So um, it's clinical. I'm not doing it like a fan. I'm not a fan of the behavior. I don't think it's cool. I don't, I don't say things like, oh, I relax to serial killer documentaries. I mean, I don't, I think that's a insulting to victims when people say things like that. I know it's a funny meme. That's not my approach. My approach is clinical. I want to learn things. I want to turn those things around to be uh, beneficial to us. And when I really need to get away, I, uh, I have, have um, a farm I go to and work on the, with the horses, the dogs, the chickens, the barn. That's very therapeutic to me. And I just forget everything, my entire world, on the outside of that and just concentrate on the animals. Yeah, that's good. Animals, animals are always comforting. They always help. When yeah. You... <laughs> and I walk every day. I walk four miles a day, Pretty usually good. in the woods. I really never, I mean, people, some people think I don't have any balance in my life, but <laughs> because I write all the time, but hey, I love writing. So why shouldn't I do it as much as I want to? It's, I've been doing it for over, well, since, been writing since 1986, I guess. Uh, it's a lot. It's a long time. Yeah. It doesn't get old. Thank you so much for, for joining us. Um, we really enjoyed um, having this conversation with you and getting to know a lot about you and your work. Well, thank you. Appreciate thank it. You. Thank you so much. You're welcome. We'd like to thank Catherine Ramsland for giving us insight into Richard Trenton Chase, vampirism, the vampire subculture, and the mental health crisis of the 1970s. Check out our website, boundbythecloak.com, for more information on Dr. Ramsland's books, articles, Richard Trenton Chase, anything else. We have it all right there for you. Be sure to follow, subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, we are wherever you get your podcasts. Thanks for listening to this episode of Bound by the Cloak. We'll see you next time. <laughs>